Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 12 on uh, radiation, the fundamentals of thermal radiation out of the textbook of Sengel and Gijar. With the previous lecture, we've started with the introduction as well as with thermal radiation. We almost completed thermal radiation, but I just want to quickly revise some of the most important topics and there was a last part we didn't get to. Okay, so thermal radiation, firstly all bodies. <coughs> all bodies, temperatures larger than zero Kelvin will have radiation. <coughs> all bodies with temperature larger than zero Kelvin will have radiation. So if we look around us, every object that we see at the moment have radiation. It doesn't mean you will always be able to see it, but everybody has radiation. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first thing. Then secondly, thermal radiation will be in the region of wavelengths larger than 0.1 and smaller than 100 micrometers. <clears throat> so on a scale, if we just can put it on a scale, and here is 0.1, <clears throat> and there's a hundred <coughs> micrometers, then that would represent the scale for thermal radiation. So thermal radiation is in that region there. <coughs> 0 0.1 to 100 micrometers. The reasons for that in terms of temperature will become clearer also later. <coughs> Then, in terms of what we can see, if we would also plot that on a scale, okay, and that would be what we will call visible light. Visible light. That would be in the region of 0.4 to 0.76. Okay. So, in that region, we will have visible light in terms of what we can see with our eyes. <clears throat> 0.44 would represent violet, the color violet, and 0.76 would represent the color of red. <clears throat> if we see a color of red, then it actually means the object would absorb all the other colors, and red is the only one that is reflected, and that is the reason why you can see it with your eyes. Right, then we have also ultraviolet. The ultraviolet, ultraviolet, let's use the color blue for that. Ultraviolet, ultraviolet will be from 0.01 to 0.4. So in this region here, We will have UV, ultraviolet. That is the part that's very, very dangerous for your skin, causes skin cancer, and also destroys or kills uh, microbacteria. <coughs> okay. Then, in terms of what we now also refer to as solar radiation, solar, if that is now 0.1 and that is 100, Solar would be from 0.3 to 3. <coughs> so all the solar radiation is in that region there, from 0.3 to 3. Okay, that is solar. <coughs> Everything from the sun. And I'm running out of color. Now the last part that we want to put there is infrared. Infrared, I'm going to put here, infrared would be the colors from red to 100. <coughs> so if we look at this scale, we can see that in terms of what we can see with our eyes, is a very, very small part of the spectrum. Most of the radiation we cannot see. So if you look at me, you will not be able to see my radiation. You can't see your radiation. But 
this a video and if I can load it, I will show you that obviously you can measure it and you can take photographs of it from using an infrared camera or an infrared video camera. Then you're able to see all the infrared radiation. <coughs> right, so that, those are the scales. Now if we look at all these different waves, how they can be generated, what is the relationship between all those waves now and what we know as heat transfer that we want to work with as engineers? Okay. What is the relationship with that? Well, the relationship is temperature. So in general, the temperature of a body <coughs> determines how active the molecules is going to be, how quickly they're going to move around. So in general, it's still very, very simple for us, and that is that the higher the temperature is of a body, the more radiation there will be. In general, the, the radiation will increase with an increase in temperature. <coughs> So, in our module, we're going to, to, to limit ourselves to thermal radiation. That radiation which has to do with temperature and heat transfer. So, that is what we're going to limit ourselves with. Right, now, it is also important to realize that the radiation is actually a volumetric thing. It happens in a volume, not only on a surface. Okay. So normally, if we would look at a body, we would say the radiation from the body, and you'll think of the surface on the outside. In some cases it is true, but in general, radiation is actually a volumetric thing. So in all gases, and in most of the liquids, if that is the gas or the liquid, then the radiation will not only occur here from the surface, but it will occur from everywhere inside the body. Okay, that is, this is just now schematically. Obviously also from the surface, but in general, from everywhere inside the body, for gases and for liquids. <coughs> However, for solids, okay, now solids are known as opaque, as opaque bodies, which means it's non-transparent, Opaque means non-transparent. Non-transparent. So for all opaque bodies, non-transparent, for example, the board I'm writing on at the moment, you can't see through it. This desk, you can't see through it. My body, you can't see through it. Okay. All those bodies, they are in general for radiation, a surface phenomenon. Okay. So everything happens actually on the surface. So if that is now the surface, then it would mean that in the first few micrometers all the radiation will be absorbed. Okay. So all the radiation is absorbed if there's radiation from the outside onto the body. <coughs> Everything happens on the surface. Okay. Right. Now, since we know about a little bit about radiation now, one of the most important things for us as engineers is always to compare. Okay. And, and in thermodynamics and heat transfer, we normally use things like efficiency. Now, the same concept is being used by introducing the black body radiation. Okay, so 12.3 is the black body. <coughs> black body radiation. So, for any body, the question would be, what is the maximum amount of radiation that can be emitted? What is the maximum that can be absorbed? Okay. Of course, if we know that, then we can always use that as a benchmark or a comparison to compare against. And that is the reason why this idealized concept of a black body has been created. So, in general, if we think of a surface, and this is now the same surface, my sketch is, as, as usual, not going to be that good, but if we have this exactly same surface, Maybe it's a piece of steel or a flat plate or something like that. Okay. And we would look at the radiation from, 
from that surface being, <coughs> as already now discussed, we will have different waves with different wavelengths from this body. Okay, so what I've tried to, to sketch there is a wave with a very, very small wavelength. Okay, and then it's going to become larger and even more larger. Okay. Now it's not that it's going to be physically, it's going to start small here and it's coming larger and larger. It happens everywhere on the surface. So all I'm trying to show you is that from a surface there are many different waves with many different wavelengths. Okay. Okay. And every one of them would transmit a certain amount of energy or it can be, or I can change the problem around in terms of how much can be absorbed. Okay, it doesn't matter. So that is now a short wavelength and that is a long wavelength. Let me try to do it here also. So here are the, all the different waves and the wavelengths become larger and larger. <coughs> okay. Now if we would, for example, would call this first wave with a certain wavelength of lambda 1, if that would be the radiation in it, then we can do the same for this wavelength, which is number 3, which would be R3, and then this one for N. And there would be an infinite number of wavelengths over the body. <coughs> okay. Now let's suppose this temperature of this surface is 300 Kelvin, and the temperature here is also 300 Kelvin. <coughs> okay, so we have the same geometry. Same geometry and same temperature. And the question would now be, same geometry, same temperature. If we would now go for this surface and this surface and we would go and plot the radiation over the surface X and let's suppose it would, it would do something like that. So that would be the value of R1, uh, that one would be for R3, etc. So for, for all of them. Okay. And I would go and I would integrate the area underneath it. then that would, de would determine the total amount of radiation that will be emitted. You agree? So the question is now, will the radiation from this surface and this surface, the total be the same? And the answer is no. <laughs> no. In some cases it can be, but in general not. What is the reason for that? Okay, so the reason, and so let me, so let's just say that our total is equal to R T1 and if I would do the same for this one then the curve might look even totally different maybe something like that and it's R total would be equal to R T2 okay so in general they will not be the same why because I didn't say anything about the surface about the surface. So the condition of the surface is very, very important. And the type of material. And the type of material. So I didn't say anything about the material and I didn't say anything about the surface. So two geometries exactly the same, at exactly the same temperature, the radiation that they will emit or absorb will not be the same, except if they are the same material and if the surface conditions are exactly the same. Only then will it happen. But in general it would not be the case. And for this reason, radi <coughs> excuse me, radiation heat transfer is a very complicated thing very complicated because as you can imagine all the different materials which are available all the different surface con conditions would determine how much radiation can 
occur from a body or how much can be absorbed. <coughs> right. So, it all comes back now to, for any one of these bodies, it's all good and well if I now go and do these experiments and I would go and get the values. Let's suppose this value is 700 and this one is 600. And after you've done it for a, for a while, you're going to ask yourself, but <laughs> what is the maximum possible value that I can get? And the maximum possible value is the value which is known as a black body. It's an idealized body. So it's an ideal, an idealized body. If we ask ourselves what is the maximum, the maximum possible heat transfer that we can get. And we want it also to be as a sort of a standard. We want to measure against it, just like efficiency in thermodynamics. We know 100% is the best that you can get. In radiation, we want to know what is the best that you can get. And for that, we use the black body concept. <coughs> so, a black body, also by definition, and let's just write it out very cryptically. Black body, by definition, okay, is the perfect emitter it's a perfect emitter so everything going out and a perfect absorber it absorbs everything going into its direction So it is a perfect emitter and a perfect absorber of radiation. So that is the definition of a black body. Okay. So if we look at this problem now, then in terms of also direction, it is important to realize that a black body, let's suppose we look at the emitting of radiation. If radiation is emitted from a certain point, then it would be perfect in all directions. My sketch isn't that nice, but for a black body, that is what would happen. So this is for a black body, and this is for a real body. And for real body, it would be something like this. If we would measure the radiation in all different directions, it wouldn't be as ideal as with a black body. With a black body, the radiation in all directions will be uniform. While for a real body, that is not the case. <coughs> in terms of, that is now when it absorbs, or when it emits, the opposite is when it absorbs. I think you've already discussed it in physics, where you've looked at this case, where you have an enclosure, something like that, with a very small hole, and radiation would be allowed to be entered through the small hole, and because we have this type of characteristics, okay, it would be perfectly be emitted in all directions. And because that happens, the radiation would be emitted in that direction. Okay. And every time when it gets to a wall, it would happen now, it will do exactly the same thing. So the radiation will bounce around on the inside until everything is absorbed and the temperature of this wall would be equal to T. So that would be the case of the perfect absorber. That is just schematically. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now, in terms of if we want to know all this radiation, how can we calculate it? Well, up to now you actually did it. In terms of the previous calculations that you did for radiation heat transfer, it is <coughs> this equation. We are now going to write it like this, E for a black body. In terms of nomenclature, things are a little bit confused at the moment, 
we are going to, to fix the nomenclature a little bit later in the, in, the, in, the, in the chapter, but let's just use E at the moment. The B indicates it's a black body, and the T indicates it's a function of temperature only. Okay, and that would be equal to the Stefan Boltzmann constant multiplied by T to the fourth, and the units in watts per square meter. And that is why I say that the terminology at the moment is a little bit confusing, because this would now be for one square meter, so if you have more than one square meter, you need to multiply it by the area. Okay, sigma multiplied by the area multiplied by t to the fourth to get the answer in watts. Okay, so in the textbook there is not a difference in terms of the nomenclature of those two symbols. Maybe previously, maybe in terms of what we are used to, because this is sort of a flux, maybe previously you can use a small e for that. It doesn't matter at this stage. Okay. What is important to realize is that this calculation gives us the integration over all the wavelengths. Okay, so that is the important thing to realize the result of this equation, which is great, a very simple equation that gives the integration for everything. Okay. And as you know, sigma is equal to 5.670 multiplied by 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter Kelvin, and that is known as the Stefan Boltzmann constant. The Stefan Boltzmann constant, <coughs> and you would also know that it's very important that in the calculations we use the temperature in Kelvin and not in degrees Celsius. Just a simple example to, to make things a little bit more clear for ourselves. <coughs> There's a question there. Can I help? Sorry, we're just looking at the units. Yep. The Stephen Boltzmann constant. Isn't it the problem to the four? Oh no, no, it's there. I think maybe a fourth there? Something like that? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so, so just check the units of that. But that's the constant. I think the constant is fine. Okay. Right. Um, <coughs> Simple example, let's suppose an area of one square meters, okay, and the temperature is at 20 degrees Celsius. <coughs> okay. Now if the surface is a black body, take note, a black body. Okay. So there it is. Okay, surface is one square meters and its temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. So if this is the surface, what is going to happen on the surface? On the surface, we are going to get very, very short wavelengths, longer ones and longer ones. And it's not that they are in order from short to tall, that they're standing there next to each other. They are all <laughs> mixed <laughs> in between. So there's another short one, there's a shorter one, etc. Those are all the waves which we cannot see, okay, but they are there. <coughs> okay. So if we now would look at the radiation, EB, and over the flat plate, then maybe it would do something like that. If we would go and calculate it at all the different points where we can measure the wavelengths. Okay. And the result of that would be equal to, EB is equal to the sigma multiplied by the area temperature to the fourth. Okay, the Stefan Boltzmann constant is equal to 5.67 multiplied by 10 to the minus 8. The surface area is 1 square meters, and the temperature would be 293 Kelvin. 273 plus 20, not 20 degrees Celsius. Oh yes, and it must be to the fourth. Okay. So, <clears throat> what would be the ideal, what would a black body radiate for us? A black body would radiate for us 410 watts. <coughs> 410 watts. That is the maximum that we can get out of a surface at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, now let's suppose tonight somebody visits you and want to sell, sell to you a solar system, a new solar system. Okay, and after a few discussions you ask him, well, what is the plate temperature going to be? 
and he's going to say, well, let's suppose the plate temperature is going to be uh, 70 degrees Celsius because it's going to heat the water to 60 degrees Celsius. Okay. And he's telling you that out of that one square meters, out of that one square meters, he can get a thousand watts of heating. Okay. So just a very simple calculation in terms of a black body. Because a black body tells us what is the maximum possible that can be done. You realize that? Okay. So the black body will tell us what is the maximum possible that can be done. So if we now do the calculation for sigma, the area temperature to the fourth, and now with the temperature we use 273 plus 70 degrees to the fourth, the Stefan Boltzmann constant we've got, surface area is 1, and the result is 684 watts. That is the maximum possible radiation that we can get out of a surface at 70 degrees Celsius. Obviously, if the temperature is higher, we can get more radiation out of it. But that is our benchmark to go and check <laughs> to make sure what we can use to measure ourselves with. Let's call it in terms of an efficiency type of a, uh, efficiency type of a criteria. Right, now, <coughs> This thing about a black body, why is it now called a black body and not an ideal body? <laughs> right. Remember that if we look at any surface, then a surface, all the light that we actually see is thermal radiation. Okay, it's a radiation. And <clears throat> if there is light that goes to a body, then it would be over this range of all the different colors, depending on the source of it. But in most cases, it will be from violet to red. Okay. So if you now look, if you are standing here and you are looking at the surface, there's your eye, and you're looking at this surface, okay, and you see it as black, then it means you observe the fact that all the color is being absorbed. Okay. Nothing is reflected. So if you see red, then it means all the other colors are being absorbed and it's only the red that is being reflected. So that's the, re that's the reason for the fact that it is called a black body because a black body is supposed to absorb all the different colors over the spectrum. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now, this is a very simple explanation and we can all say, yeah, but this makes sense. But now when you start doing measurements, now things becomes much more complicated. So, let's look at the very interesting case of snow. <clears throat> so let's suppose there's snow, and if things are going well, then maybe we might be so fortunate in the next few days that we can get snow in Pretoria or Johannesburg, or close by in any case there is, apparently. Okay. So, <coughs> if we now think of snow, if, if light reflects onto snow, okay, then what is reflected is the white part of the light. Okay? And a certain part is being absorbed. What is interesting is that with snow, okay, all the waves of long wavelengths are actually absorbed. The long wavelengths are absorbed, not the short ones. So snow can be a very, very good absorber of radiation. It doesn't reflect everything. Okay. The same is with... Uh, yeah. Right, so if we want now to have a black body or a body that absorbs a lot of radiation, what do we do now? Do we make it white so that it can absorb all the long wavelengths or what do we do in terms of color? <coughs> <coughs> the 
course, the case of snow is one of many cases. Okay. So in general, it actually means a, the color as we see it with our eyes. Where we normally would say black is a good absorber of heat is not correct. Okay. And the reason is, you know, what we can see is this, but what happens in the total visible or the total wavelength range is so huge that our eye is not a good observer of of what is a good absorber of radiation. Okay. So there are many, many cases where the color is not really a good reflection of what happens. But practically, if you want to be practical, if you want to be a practical engineer and you want to go and build something like a solar collector now that should absorb all the radiation, what color must you paint it? Well, the answer is still very, is still the same. It is uh, lamp black paint. Okay. So if you have lamp black paint and you have a surface and you paint it with that paint, which is, uh, which is black, uh, not a very shiny uh, black, a matte type of black, then it would actually absorb quite a lot of radiation. Right. Now in terms of uh, the cases where we had, uh, again, in terms of a surface. <coughs> so if we have a surface now, <coughs> and this is the surface, and on a, on a micro level, that is typically what can, how it can look like, then we will have the sh very short wavelengths, we will have longer ones, very, very long ones, short one here and because of the surface geometry this one is going to reflect in this direction there and that one is going to reflect in that direction there and let's start calling them R1 and R2 and all of them up to Rn over the total range of wavelengths from zero to infinite. <coughs> So how do we now, for a very, for one specific wavelength, calculate the radiation? Well, that was done by Max Planck in 1901, and he formulated the following equation: E B, and take note now, as a function of lambda. So previously it was just E B, the black body radiation, as a function of temperature, because it integrated everything. With this now, it's going to be at the specific wavelength. That can be calculated by, equation looks like this, C1 divided by lambda to the fifth, multiplied by E to the C2, divided by lambda T minus 1. Okay. So that is the equation that we use for that, and its units take note, it's equal to watts per square meter and in the textbook it is per micrometer. <coughs> okay, so the constant in the textbook is micrometer. Okay, so if you want to know what is the wavelength at three micrometers, you're just going to put in three and not three multiplied by ten to the minus six. Now I personally do not like working like that. I like the SI units, so I, I like to stay with that. And if you do that, in any case, then you can go and calculate C1. And C1 is equal to 2 times pi multiplied by HC0 square, where H is Planck's constant. We've done it with the previous lecture. Okay, H is Planck's constant, and that is equal to 6.6. To 6069, something like that, multiplied by 10 to the minus 34. And C2 is equal to H multiplied by C0 divided by K, where K, okay, so take note, H in this case is not the transfer coefficient and K is not the thermal conductivity. Okay, and K is equal to 
the Boltzmann constant, which is equal to 1.38065 multiplied by 10 to the minus 23 joules per second. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. And C, <coughs> we know that C1, okay, then, then what it says is that is now for in a vacuum, and if it's not a vacuum, then we must replace C1 by C1 divided by N. Well, N is the index, index of a refraction. We know for in a vacuum it is equal to 1. In air it's also approximately equal to 1. In glass it's 1.5. In water it's 1.33. Okay. Okay. And in the textbook there are now two values for C1 and C2. But if you use those constants, then it's very important, then in that equation you have to be very careful the units that you use. Okay. These days it's very easy to just put it in a spreadsheet, and I did it this morning, very, very easy to go and calculate it. Right, <coughs> so that now gives the radiation at a specific wavelength and temperature. <coughs> Okay. What we now can do is we can actually now generate a very, very interesting curve. And this curve looks like this. The energy of a body, which is a function also of the wavelength. And it's a function of the wavelength. Now let's suppose we have a body and its temperature is 100 Kelvin. Okay. Uniformly, it's a very uniform body, one square meter, and its temperature is 100 Kelvin. So what we now can do is we can use this equation, put in 100 Kelvin there, and for all the different wavelengths, go and plot the curve. Okay. And the curve looks something like this. Okay. That is now for 100 kelvins. <coughs> okay, so for all the different wavelengths, we can go and calculate the energy. And remember, everything underneath the curve is equal to sigma area t to the fourth, the integration of it. Okay, so that is typically how the curve would look like. Now let's start increasing the temperature. If you increase the temperature, then it starts looking like that. So typically bodies here at 20 degrees Celsius at 293 Kelvin, typically the curve would look like that. Right, now we should be curious. If we keep on increasing the temperature, what happens? <laughs> well, if we keep on increasing the temperature, We've got about the same thing happening. And then we get to the body with a temperature of 5,800 Kelvin. And what body will that be? It will be the sun. Okay. The sun, 5,800 Kelvin. Okay. And what is now very beautiful from nature is that the peak in terms of the wavelengths, guess what? Those peaks, if we look at these wavelengths of 0.4 to 0.76, it falls just over the maximum. Okay, so our eyes can actually see the maximum radiation from the sun. There's a lot we cannot see, like we can see the peak, the maximum. It's approximately attuned to our eyes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this curve that I've drawn here, my sketch isn't that, that good. Let me see if I can give you the right one in the textbook. Um,
Right. So, Erin, if you can just focus there on the curve for us. So that is how the curve looks on scale. Take note on the horizontal axis. Okay. Let me see if I can use the mouse to show you. Yes, this. Okay, so on the horizontal scale, take note it is not a linear scale, it is a logarithmic scale. Okay, so there's the logarithmic scale from about 0.01 to about 1000, take note, micrometers. And then that is the radiation for all the different temperatures. And if we connect the maximum values with each other, then that forms a straight line approximately. And the equation that describes that straight line is called Wien's equation, Wien's displacement law. Okay. And it looks like this, lambda t is equal to 2897.8 micrometers per Kelvin. <coughs> micrometers per Kelvin. And there is the maximum of the Sun. So the temperature of the Sun is 5800. And there you can see with violet would start and there is red. So our eyes can see in that visible range there which is the maximum of the Sun. Okay? Any questions? Right. Mm. I'm just wondering, uh, the other graph that you drew below the uh, surface there, the EV, is that versus the um, position X, or is that also versus the, um, the lambda? Sorry, which graph was that? Um, so, um, the one below the example. Uh, this? Uh, the ones to the right. Uh, to the right. That small one, the small graph over there. This one, yeah. No, no, to the right. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry, this one, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. So this position, yeah. So, so I've just tried to show you if you would if you would be able to go and look on a microscopic level at every point on the surface, then you will have different wavelengths. The wavelengths are a function of the temperature, but also the material and the surface finish. So it's a very complicated thing. And there's not there's not one wavelength. Okay, and that is the same with the sun. So if we look at the sun the temperature at 5,800 Kelvin, okay? Then the radiation is not uniform. It has a large variety of wavelengths, from very small to very large. But for a black body, do you assume that it is uniform? For a black body... <coughs> over the surface, not over the... Yeah. Yes, I'm going to... No, no, it is... For a black body, the wavelengths are also not uniform. It also is, it's also over a spread, and we're going to address it just now. So we're on our way doing it, okay? If we, are not, if we do not run out of time, okay? Okay, so before I get to that, let's just first look at the case of this equation now, this Wien's equation, okay? Now the thing with equations is they, are, they stand there on paper, we see it, we look at it, but in many cases we can learn a lot from it by just doing a very, very simple calculation. And that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so let's look at the case now of exactly 5,800 Kelvin. So if we now look at this curve of EB, as a function of lambda, of that curve which connects all the maximum points. Okay, it connects all the maximum points. If you look there at the sketch, Erin, if you can look at the sketch just again for us. So if you look at all the maximum points, that dotted line, okay, is this equation. Lambda t is equal to 2897.8. Take note, micrometers per Kelvin. Okay. So the question is now, at a temperature of 5800 Kelvin, what would the wavelength be at that specific temperature, 5800 exact? Okay, now that's very easy because now we've got that equation, lambda t is equal to 2897.8 micrometer per Kelvin. Now we've got lambda and the temperature is 5800 Kelvin 
is equal to 2897.8 and if we solve lambda then it is going to be 9 point uh, no it's, sorry it is going to be 0 point <coughs> 0.58 micrometers 0.58 micrometers now that specific wavelength <coughs> right so if we look at all the thing yeah if you if we look at all the different colors that's available there and that specific wavelength, 0.58, what color would it represent? It's yellow. <coughs> okay. Now the sun, the surface of the sun, if you go and look at pictures, you will say, see that the temperature is not uniformly 5,800. So that's the reason why we also have other colors there, but in average, you know, in terms of the temperature of 5,800, it represents the color of yellow. <coughs> Makes sense, isn't it? Right. Now, let's change the problem a little bit around. We want to see now what happens to this board or your bench, which is now maybe at 20 degrees Celsius. What wavelength would that represent? Okay. So, again, we can now use this equation for at 20 degrees Celsius which is a temperature of 293. I'm not going to bore you with writing it out, but I mean, just put in 293 there, do the wavelength calculation, and the wavelength calculation tells us it is 9.72 micrometers. 9.72, <clears throat> right. If we now look at this thing that I've drawn here, nine, we see visible is between 0.4 and 0.76. Okay, where would nine be? Nine would be year three. It would be year somewhere. <coughs> so it is in the infrared region. You cannot see it with your eyes, but you can take a picture of it with the infrared camera. And then you can see it. Okay, and it is also outside the solar one. So it's not from the sun. Okay. Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We will continue with the next on Monday again. <coughs>